Our top story this morning, voters in New York, Utah, Oklahoma, Maryland, and Colorado head to the polls in key primary elections. Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney is looking to clinch the Republican nomination for a Utah Senate seat. In Maryland, two African-American candidates are vying to become the state's next governor. President Trump is urging South Carolina voters to cast their ballots for incumbent Governor Henry McMaster in the state's runoff election today. The president held a rally with Governor McMaster Monday night and spoke out about trade, immigration, and other topics. President Trump recently began suggesting illegal immigrants be deported without due process. Meanwhile, in Northern California, a state of emergency is in effect. Firefighters there are battling a raging wildfire that's burned through thousands of acres since Saturday. Hundreds of homes have been evacuated. Now closer to home, pro-tribal officials say they're unable to account for as much as $14.5 million in federal transportation grants given to the tribe in 2016. That information is from a federal audit released Monday. The Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Interior says the tribe failed to file financial reports, track expenses, and was unable to provide supporting documents for the contracts or submit a single audit for the 2016 fiscal year. The contracts in question were part of a tribal transportation agreement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The program was designed to provide engineering, construction, and maintenance for roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure related to tribal needs. Tribal officials told auditors they discovered that former financial department officials apparently did not know how to properly manage federal contracts. The events described in the audit report took place during the tenure of former Former Chairman Darren Old Coyote. In response, current Chairman A.J. Not Afraid Jr. said after his inauguration, he quote, vowed to clean up the mismanagement of grants and programs that has occurred over the last decade. Change takes time, but it continues to be the priority of this Crow administration. A new study commissioned by the Montana Chamber of Commerce says the early closure of the two newest coal strip power plants will have a huge negative economic impact on the entire state. But critics of the study say it ignores key information that will offset those impacts. The study by the University of Montana Bureau of Business and Economic Research examined the effects if coal strip plants 3 and 4 close in 2027. Bureau Director Patrick Barkey says it will mean the loss of 3,300 jobs across the state, ranging from coal mining to plant operations to suppliers. The study also says Montana electricity consumers will end up paying higher prices because they'll have to buy power from other out-of-state sources. But a leading environmental lobby says that assumption is not true. And Hedges with the Montana Environmental Information Center in Helena says a coal strip closure will mean negative impacts for some, but not for consumers look at uh, solar, when you look at wind energy, those are out-competing coal in the marketplace right now. And they're pretending in this study that in 20 years, coal will be out-competing these resources. That's, it's not true today. Why would it be true in 20 years? We need to be prepared. Is there an opportunity to continue the, the plant going longer? Can we look at other ways of uh, adapting uh, for the tax base, for the personal side as well, workforce training. So no time like the present. Uh, let's get started at looking at it now. Coal strip plants one and two are slated for closure by 2022, but no date has been set for the closure of the newer plants three and four, which are co-owned by six different companies. Turning to Crime Watch, two teens who were shot Sunday evening in Missoula are out of surgery and expected to recover. Missoula Police Captain Mike Coyler says a handgun consistent with other evidence was found on Sentinel High School property Monday afternoon. The search for the male suspect and the shooting continues. Authorities stress there is no danger to the public. Investigators say they have been able to talk to one of the victims to gather more information. 
Here in Billings, a tenured teacher with School District 2 was fired following a unanimous vote by the school board. Glenn Canvick has worked in the school district since the mid-1980s. His termination Monday follows complaints regarding his conduct with students that date back more than a decade. Canvick has been disciplined several times by the district, including placement on employment improvement plans. In a five-page letter to the board, School District 2 Superintendent Terry Bauk recommended that Canvick be dismissed. In that letter, Bauk states that Canvick lacks the basic skills necessary to be an effective teacher and that he engaged in inappropriate and damaging conduct. Bauk also told the board he has no confidence in Canvick's ability to contribute as a school employee. The superintendent's letter included accusations that Canvick made inappropriate sexual comments to students. Canvick and union representative Scott McCullough also testified at Monday's hearing. Canvick can appeal the board's decision. Meanwhile, in Missoula, the young woman killed in a hit and run incident over a week ago was honored on Monday. Present to honor Rebecca Romero was Montana Lieutenant Governor Mike Cooney. Romero was a recent graduate from the University of Montana and had already joined the Montana National Guard. Guard members were also on hand to present Romero's family with a special flag and to pay tribute to their fallen comrade. Daniel Grady is accused of hitting Romero with his vehicle. He's still in jail, held on a $100,000 bond. In other news, most Americans would admit they have lots of stuff. Getting rid of it may seem daunting, but some people are hiring others to do it for them. CBS's Laura Podesta takes a look at the business of professional organization. Alexis Belmoth admits she has too much stuff. My thing has always been like, oh, I'll just put it in the closet, I'll put it under the bed. So we'll just go through every single thing. We'll Instead of tackling this mess alone, she hired Done and Done Home a professional organizing business founded by this mother-daughter team. What is the most difficult part of getting someone to get rid of their stuff? The biggest sort of category would be sentimental items um, that are the hardest to get rid of. Done and Done not only cleans out closets, donates unwanted items, we'll donate. and hauls away junk, clients get tips on buying quality over quantity. But it isn't cheap. This was expensive, $2,000 mm -hmm. for one day of organizing. That's like a vacation. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's just a necessity. Like, for me, it is. Like, it's money well spent. The business of organization is catching on. More people are hiring organizers. Jessica Kennedy is with the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals, which now has thousands of members in 49 states. And it's not just people cleaning closets. It's like even photo organizing is now just a niche thing for professional organizers. Or tech organizing, where it's just your computer, your email, things like that. Social media may also be helping business. Posts of spotless spaces are racking up the likes. Belmoff is surprised her studio went from looking like this to this in just a few hours. This feels like a totally new apartment and it went by really quickly. And moving forward, she's hoping to keep her space decluttered and organized. Laura Podesta, CBS News, New York.